Hello there, my fellow campaign reinforcements, and welcome to your weekly entry in the Siege of Vrax. For today, we arrive at the whooping part 17 in our coverage. Previously, we talked about the so-called Second Space Battle of Vrax, and how the Chaos Battleship was eventually chased away, albeit at a heavy cost. Today, we will talk about what happened next, with the reinforcements finally arriving to help the embattled Kriegans. Since I don't do any polls in this series, I would also kindly ask you to support by watching, liking, sharing, and maybe even checking out other videos in the playlist. That being said, I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The convoy finally arrived in the orbit of Vrax, and began to disembark its cargo. Soon, men in their thousands, tanks in their hundreds, thousands of tons of ammo, fuel and equipment all were taken to the front. Among the many unloading cargo landers was also a huge armored landing ship setting down. Down the exit ramps walked the warhounds and reavers of the Legio Astorum commanded by the High Princeps Rand Drauka. In total, there were 22 Titans, bedecked in honor banners and emblazoned with the Eagle of the Imperium and the Black Eclipse symbol of their legion. Now, even while the poor 19th Regiment was being destroyed, Marshal Kagori's offensive was being planned, ready to begin the next big attempt to crack the inner defense line. Preparation for such a huge offensive action were long and convoluted. Each regiment in the line now required vast amounts of staff work to equip new guardsmen with everything they needed. The ammunition and fuel stockpiles had to be built up, along with new supplies of all kinds. Companies of men and batteries of guns were on the move, being positioned for the coming battle, while the regimental commissars worked day and night on their attack plans. As it has become known, the Kagori Offensive was set to begin on 249 A25 M41. The objective was to recapture all the lost ground since the enemy counteroffensive, and then to proceed and crack the inner defensive line. It was a very ambitious plan, and it took almost a year to prepare the battered siege regiments for the coming offensive. One of the major decisions for the Marshal's headquarters would be the deployment of the Titan Battle Group. Although his own command didn't permit to give the Legio Astorum Princeps direct orders, his reports to the Lords of the Lucius Forge World would influence any decision they made. All of the Reavers and the Warhounds would operate in support of the 12th Line Corps' four siege regiments, the 143rd, the 149th, the 150th, and the 158th. They would also be backed up by elements of the 8th Assault Corps, including super heavy tanks. The first part of the plan involved a prolonged artillery bombardment. With the system now secured, more supply convoys were arriving every week. Millions of shells were being transported and stockpiled at the artillery positions. The long bombardment of the enemy was gradually stepped up over the weeks before Marshal Kagori's plan was ready to be put into action. In the last days before the infantry offensive was to begin, the bombardment intensified, and then stepped up again and again until the guns were hammering away relentlessly. Eventually, on the allotted day, everything was in place. In the forward trenches, all across Vrax, the first of the assault companies were ready, bayonets fixed, awaiting the order to attack. Across no man's land, the artillery shells impacted in a furious tempest on the enemy front line. And then, suddenly, the guns fell silent. In Sector 54-46, Colonel Fryan of the 143rd Regiment had joined his men an ensign carrying the honored regimental banner at his shoulder. On time, the colonel ordered the launch of a single red flare arching into Vrax's sky. It was time to go. The men would scramble up the parapet like so many thousands of times before, and out into no man's land. Behind them, Lehman Russes and Macarius tanks thumped into gear and began to grind forward. 
Batteries of mortars launched a barrage of smoke and high explosive shells to keep the enemy gunners' heads down. Still further back, High Princeps Rand Drauka received the attack signal on the command bridge of his reaver, known as Praetorian. The other titans followed their commander's lead and the Legio Astorum strode into battle. All along the 12th Line Corps front, the same scenario was being played out. Infantry and tanks plunged into the inevitable defensive fire, slithering through the quagmire to reach the enemy razor wire, their trenches and their pillboxes. The tanks laid out a heavy curtain of explosive shells, their heavy bolters and heavy stubbers rattling out a stream of suppressive fire. The mortars and the field guns opened fire again, lobbing shells just ahead of the infantry. The battle proper had been joined. For the first few hours, it seemed that the battle was being fought in the same old way, and with the same old results. Heavy losses for little to no gain. But on the 12th Line Corps front, the attack was proceeding well. The metal monsters of the Legio Astorum were advancing, crushing everything in their path. In Sector 54-45, the enemy counterattack with their own tanks and infantry, and the battle developed in the center of no man's land, all the way down to bayonets and knives. Tanks were burning, but they could not stop the advance of Drauka. Soon, Thunderbolt fighters were screaming overhead, adding their bombs and strafing autocannons to the maelstrom of fire descending upon the enemy. By the end of the first day, the 158th Regiment had recovered the ground it had lost previously, and all the regiments could report good progress wherever the Titans were backing them up. At nightfall, the Titans withdrew to safety to repair and rearm, while fresh waves of tanks and infantry were pushed forward for the next day's advance. Across the entirety of Van Meerland wastes, the siege regiments reported a variety of successes and failures. Wherever the Chaos Space Marine warbands joined the fighting, obviously the Kriegans fared poorly. The 5th Regiment had come under intense chemical attack and sustained very heavy losses. In response, their regiment requested that they be allowed to respond in kind. Marshal Kagori, against the advice of many of his staff, did indeed grant permission for their own chemical weapons to be used. And so, the barrages of the 5th Regiment were soon soaking the land in more toxic poison. Because, obviously, poison and chemicals are exactly what works best against the followers of Nurgle. Little did they suspect that they were playing into enemy hands, even with the losses they momentarily inflicted. The second day of the offensive started with more air attacks, but this time the enemy countered with their own thunderbolts and hellblades, and all the aircraft were twisting and swooping high above the battlefield. In Sector 57-48, two waves of Marauder bombers hammered the enemy frontline, racing in low and fast to unload their huge payload directly onto the enemy trenches. With such heavy air support, the 468th Regiment made good gain, and Marshal Kagori noted that more Imperial Navy bomber squadrons should be requested. As a great lightning storm rolled about them, the titans of Drauka pitched forward into the battle again. Praetorian itself quickly destroyed 11 enemy tanks in succession. But just as the weapons Moderati reported the targets destroyed, the Reaver's augurs identified enemy titans on the move. After the previous day's heavy losses, the enemy was finally responding with titans of their own. Legio Volcanum had come out to play. Turbo lasers and volcano cannons flashed, void shields sparked and flared, blazing under the high energy impacts of massive weapons. Soon, their missile launchers were empty. The ammunition hoppers of the Gatling blasters were running low, as the six barreled cannons hammered out shell after shell. Plasma reactors were straining under the demand. The servitors and the tech priests working furiously to direct extra power to the void shields and weapon arrays as the titans growled and groaned under the stresses. The titan in Viglia Alpha was the first one to fall. Closing with the enemy, the reaver was raked by fire from a Vulcan megaboulder, and the last of its void shields were overloaded and shut down. 
a superheated blast melted through the thick armor and blast shielded screens, immolating the entire bridge crew in a second. More enemy fire lashed the Titan as it simply stood there, motionless and defenseless. The sole surviving tech priest could not abandon the dying machine. He simply fell to his knees in prayer as the Titan shuddered and groaned in its own death agony. And it would be there that the God Machine would stay for the duration of the war, a towering landmark in a barren landscape. The Titanic battle, pun intended, lasted all day, with giants dueling over the heads of the men below. Progress had been slowed, without the direct aid of the Titans, there was hard fighting all across the front. And by the end of the second day, with the Titans withdrawing, little extra ground had actually been gained. Day 3 would see this battle resume, and then grind on into Day 4. As the fighting resumed on Day 5, both sides had suffered heavy losses. Of all the regiments of the offensive, the 143rd had pushed on the furthest, driving a salient into the enemy line in Sector 54-45. And it would be here that the Titan battle group would concentrate its efforts. A slim crack could be forced open, and failing that it would draw the enemy Titans to them, and, with any luck, allow another regiment to force the breakthrough further down the line. With the Titans rearmed and battlefield repairs completed by the Adeptus Mechanicus Adepts, Drauka again led the survivors into the Inferno. After five days of battle, the enemy line was finally thinning. They had lost a lot of men and equipment during the first day's battle, and now those losses were being felt. The enemy titans had taken losses as well, and only their fearsome presence had stemmed the tide anyway. But now, outnumbered and bearing the scars of three days of fighting, the Legion of Volcanum war machines pulled back to regroup. The enemy infantry could not hold out alone against the firepower of Drauka. They did manage to topple one Warhound with a battery of basilisks, but that was all they could do. Some of the renegades fought with fanatical zeal, but many others had their will broken by so-called Titan Shock, and soon fell into a pell-mell retreat. One more day of fighting saw the inner defense line breached, and new tank columns streaming through the gap. Finally, they had success. Kagori's offensive had broken through the defensive belt and was now driving ever deeper towards the curtain wall. The Titans were indeed winning them the war. However, unlike in the past when the outer and second defense lines had been broken, the enemy did not abandon the positions this time. The area around the curtain wall and the inner defense line was no longer a bare plain. It was now riddled with a maze of trenches and pillboxes, all built up over the years as the siege had ground on. It did lack the hardened dugouts and careful planning of the actual defense lines, but the enemy still had many places from which they could make a stand and they would fight for every inch of ground. The traitor commanders knew that they could not afford to pull back to the curtain wall and dig in again. They could not afford falling back, as soon there would be nowhere to fall back to. So, this time, there were no sudden clear breakthroughs or swift advances, only a monotonous scroll of daily attacks and counterattacks. But in Sector 54-45, the enemy might was spent and the 143rd Regiment had made large gains before it too had to halt. The Titans were withdrawn from the front line to the reserve, to refit and await the next deployment. They had made their difference and won their battle. Their losses, some four Reavers and seven Warhounds, would have to be replaced back on Lucius. It was estimated that in all, a dozen enemy Titans were destroyed which was a fine total for the men of Drauka, who could now return to Lucius with honor. The battle to reach the curtain wall was not over. There were many battles yet to be fought, but Marshal Kagori was already preparing a new phase in the offensive. The outcome of the siege was no longer in doubt. The enemy losses had been heavy, and new replacements would soon arrive for the Krieg regiments. The enemy losses were irreplaceable, 
and Kagori knew that attrition always favored a besieger. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the new offensive, the so-called Kagori Offensive, from the Siege of Rax for today. If you're worried that the series is coming to an end soon, you shouldn't be, as we're only halfway there. What are your thoughts on this new offensive? Or the new marshal? Do you think he has what it takes to win the war now? Let us all know what you think about the entire matter in the comments below. If you found the video informative or entertaining, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching to the end and I wish you all a great and peaceful day. The Emperor Protects